The following episode and message is sponsored by Baxter. Can screen time be good for you? It can in Infusion Delivery when it's the exclusive on-screen barcode of Baxter's Novum IQ Infusion platform. No more fading or peeling stickers. It's an easy and reliable way to associate pump to patient. Another reason Novum IQ is a pump platform like no other. Learn more at discovernovumiq.com. Hello, and welcome to NANCAST. I'm Jill, your host. Neonatology is constantly evolving, and NICU nurses are not just caregivers. They're innovators, leaders, creative problem solvers, and change makers. In the NICU, every moment counts, and innovation can make a world of difference for our tiniest patients. How many times have you thought of a better design for a product but don't know where to start? How can we, as NICU nurses or APRNs, translate those ideas into reality? How can we drive change in the industry? Today, we'll be joined by Beth Schinkel and Kelly Thompson, who are at the forefront of pioneering new techniques, technologies, and practices that enhance the care and outcomes for our critically ill newborns. Beth is a NICU nurse whose passion for improving neonatal nutrition feeding options led her to develop a point-of-care medical device to concentrate fresh breast milk and or donor milk so that preterm infants won't need cow milk fortifiers added to their feedings. She co-founded Mother's Milk is Best, Inc. with Elizabeth Nelson, a medical device engineer, and have received NIH funding for preclinical studies. Kelly Thompson is a neonatal nurse practitioner with over 18 years of NICU experience. Kelly designed a positioning aid to use for umbilical line placement that was more developmentally appropriate than what they were currently using. We will hear their stories, learn about the groundbreaking projects they're working on, and discuss how their innovative approach are reshaping the NICU experience for both patients and families. Let's get right into it. Thank you, ladies, for joining us today. We all know that nurses are natural problem solvers, and they also are very creative. Tell us why we should translate that skill set into nursing innovation. Beth, tell us why you think all nurses should be innovating. Well, I think because nurses are in this, you're, they're providing care, and so they're really in it, and they see it from the perspective um, of what's really going to be helpful and, and new. And so sometimes I think, I think everybody's been in that position where you get something new in the NICU or any place in the hospital and you look at it and you think, who is in the room <laughs> <laughs> when they came up with this? And, you know, it's just, you ask yourself like, what was missing, you know? And, and a lot of times I think it was a nurse, the nurse was missing, you know, the voice of the nurse is so busy providing care that, um, that we think to ourselves, like somebody else will do it. And um, my experience is that nurses really have a lot to offer. And yet, like, we don't feel that way necessarily. So we, we kind of just sort of think of like staying in our lane. But when you really look at what nurses could provide and how it would benefit babies and patients in general, um, there's so much there. So I think that's why nurses should be really driving the bus on this one. I feel like nurses should be innovators because anytime you walk into any unit um, like a NICU, you can look around and you will see nurses who are doing their own thing by their patients' bedsides to whether it's to hang a feeding, whether it's to do something to the baby. They are always they're always trying to make something so that way it will help the process go along. So I feel like we're always trying as nurses to innovate. What can we do to make this situation better, make this process better and stuff? And like I said, you'll see it if you walk into a NICU, if you walk by a baby's bedside, you might see a feeding hanging a different way than the syringe pump instead of going over a syringe pump. Um, You could walk in and see, you know, something with a respiratory, you know, device doing something differently or IV fluids just to make the process a little easier for the nurses. Um, So I feel like... We are always just trying to improve stuff, so therefore we are natural innovators. I totally agree. I think that nurses have the unique ability to intertwine their evidence-based practice skills and their, you know, practical clinical knowledge, create devices and products that work. Just like Beth said, you know, we see these new products and we think, who made this? Because oftentimes they don't have that much input of a NICU nurse. Um, So... 
you know, like Kelly said, you walk down and you see different ways that people hang a feeding and maybe some nurse is onto something um, and she's, you know, inadvertently created some really new um, innovation that could make things easier. Um, but I, I think that nurses just lack the knowledge of how to proceed with these new innovations that they've created. So that's why I'm really lucky to have two nurse leaders here that can explain to us how they paved the way forward to their nurse-led innovations. So Beth, do you want to tell us uh, your story um, on your nursing innovation journey? I think I was working in a level three NICU and I, um, I think occasionally we would, you know, we would always make changes into care, um, but I was kind of so busy at the time that it wasn't until I moved across the country and I was interviewing and looking at what was in hospitals. And I realized that like there wasn't something a lot better um, than what we were doing in the NICU. And, uh, and I was, I was thinking <laughs> that um, Colorado used uh, donor milk really early and I was really excited about using donor milk in the NICU. And so when I was interviewing these hospitals, um, I thought that they were going to be using only donor milk and it turned out they were using like still formula. And so um, I was thinking about it and I came up with a concept of a medical device to remove some water at point of care from mother's own milk, like fresh milk or thawed, whatever. And then, um, then I went to people that I had worked with in the past and I asked them, do you think this would work? And to my surprise, people were really like, you know, super positive and, and encouraging about it. So I ended up um, kind of drawing up like like a patent, applied for a patent after I did try to contact some people, like companies thinking they would just go ahead and do it, but it turned out that no, <laughs> they kind of want you to do it, I guess. So, so I went ahead and uh, filed a patent and then I continued to work on um, the, the prototype for the device and then working with uh, teams and getting grants from the NIH and state, we were able to do proof of concept and publish um, and do studies. And so now we're planning to go to market in the next um, year and a half. That's amazing. And you said um, you needed to apply for a patent. Now, is that a really difficult process? Because I feel like nurses don't have that business mindset all the time. And that might be a roadblock or a challenge that nurses might face if they want to move forward with an idea. So that was sort of a unique situation. And I was between, I wasn't actually like working in the hospital I was interviewing because I just moved. So when you work for a hospital system, generally intellectual property is um, potentially owned by the hospital system. So it might be actually easier to then contact an office and say within your hospital system, like I have this idea, it would definitely change ownership, um, but they would help you potentially file that patent. Filing a patent is actually not that intimidating. You can do like a provisional and you just put like the, um, the application in and it's like almost like a placeholder. Um, and then, then you follow up and it gets expensive down the road. But if you're working for a hospital system already, um, you might not own it like all or, you know, I own part of it, but the hospital would be helpful in getting like the fees paid for and everything <laughs> and moving forward. So that could be a huge help. As far as developing a prototype, how is that process? So when creating a prototype, um, it, it sort of depends on what exactly um, you're, you're trying to do. So if you're in a, a NICU and you're already sort of like, you know, making something yourself, um, you might be able to just make the prototype yourself. Like you, you figured out how to do it. Um, I was using technology that I wasn't like able to like make at home myself or anything. So I um, searched online for retail uh, membrane manufacturers that made the kind of osmotic filter that I thought I was going to need. And so I looked online and I found a few different companies that made, um, you know, like the the components that I would need for uh, the the device. And I ordered them um, and had them sent to my house. And then I tested it with like cow's milk and then I had my sister send me breast milk that she pumped herself uh, for her new baby and she sent it on dry ice and I concentrated milk in my kitchen uh, and like used a little food scale and then I sent it out to a USDA lab and once I felt like I got the results uh, that really, you know, gave me the um, confidence that this, this uh, concept would work 
that's when I started to bring in um, like advisors, researchers, and even um, engineers to help me look at a way to de- like make this device specifically for premature babies. Uh, but there are companies out there, and I, I've worked with some of them and just consulted um, with them. But they'll, you go to them and you tell them what you want, and they can do either a 3D model or they can help you build that prototype. So there are companies out there for somebody who's independently working that they could help you bring that together. And I work with a medical device engineer. She's a co founder with me, um, Elizabeth, and she's amazing and she's done great work. Um, but she's really helped me with that. And, you find somebody that will partner with you and work with you and, and you can really bring it, um, you know, right to market that way. If you don't have maybe the knowledge base for creating something as far as like you have a filtration system. So obviously nurses don't have that biochemical knowledge as much. So you, it's not, that's not, that shouldn't be a roadblock to continue forward that you, there is paths to create the uh, prototype because then you would be reaching out to other experts in, in that area and more of a collaborative effort? Yes, yes. so definitely with, with that, because um, when you're doing something like this, the, the person asking the questions, the innovator who's asking the questions, like, what can we do? How can we do this? Um, they're, they're like bringing in knowledge from, you know, consultants or bringing in uh, people to help them develop that. Um, so the asking the question and coming up with the, like, why aren't we doing this question is usually the impetus to like move forward and figure it out. Um, Because I learned a lot about membranes, but I'm certainly not like, uh, you know, a biochemist. um, And I definitely rely on engineers that I work with and, you know, and, and I definitely defer to people with their skill sets. When we do studies, for example, I might help collect milk (laughs) and concentrate it, but I'm shipping it out to like university labs all across the country. And the experts are really doing that analysis. So, um, I I consult with them all the time. And I think there's like a partnership to make sure, you know, if you try to reinvent the wheel, you're, you're going to take a long time to do something. And it's, it could be so challenging that would be like, you know, sort of discouraging, but there are a lot of people out there that really want to help babies. And I feel like that's opened up so many doors. Like so many people are excited about helping babies. And so they will start working with you and talk to you and help you um, bring a prototype, you know, to be made. And it's sometimes it's not as hard as you think, like to bring something together like that. But you can definitely you just keep asking the questions and people will sort of guide you through. Um, and I, def- I think I'm a good example of that because I really did not know how to do any of this. (laughs) And it's been a great learning experience. um, But I've learned a lot from other people. Great, because I I think that is a huge uh, stepping stone for nurses when they think of these ideas, like, how do I move that forward? Because it might not be something like more biomedical engineering focused. So you feel like, oh, well, I'll never be able to do that. And it's just a, a pipe dream. But I think if you know how to approach the right people um, and and go through the right channels. Like nothing is impossible, it seems. Like the road is wide open um, once you are able to find somebody, the right connection to help move your product forward or your idea to become a reality. So Kelly, what is your journey? So my journey started during COVID. Um, We actually had a um, NICU product company at our hospital showing us a uh, new um, ET tube that had like a little med port on the side. So if we wanted to intubate and give um, surfactant, you know, you could just use a little med port and stuff like that. And I just was commenting like, you know, whoever came up with this is, you know, a genius because that way you're not having to cut and, you know, add a new piece and the whole nine yards, especially if you just want to intubate and surf the kid. So I started talking with the rep and stuff like that. And he was like, oh, you know, I do stuff on the side. I have a little company where I represent, you know, medical staff and, you know, anybody who's got like medical inventions and stuff like that. Um, So if there's ever an idea you have, you know, you feel free to reach out to me. I can kind of help you and stuff. And I'm like, well, actually, I do have an idea. (laughs) I'm like, and I was kind of talking to him about it. And I was explaining how we position babies for umbilical line placements and stuff and you know, the big thing was um, neurodevelopmental at this point in time, like it was a big push, you know, everything we need to make sure with our babies that we're doing everything, you know, developmentally appropriate and protecting of them. And then I go, you know, right now we just use um, restraints on their hands and legs and we tie them to the bed. And I go, that's not really appropriate for these babies. So I was just, you know, kind of telling him how I came up with this prototype in my basement with some extra 
fabric I had on hand, my sewing machine, and I my daughter's baby dolls. And so he's like, okay, well, send me some pictures and some information. So I emailed him some pictures of what I came up with. And just, he wanted, like, the information, like, what do we use? How much does that cost? Like, the information on preterm babies, like, that we put lines in. How many are, you know, born on average in a year? And, like, stuff like that. So he came, he helped me come up with, like, a big PowerPoint presentation. And then kind of lined up companies to kind of listen to our presentation. Um, and at first, the companies he kind of was presenting to weren't I felt like a good fit for this product because they weren't whether they were for lines or positioning like some of they just weren't a good fit I could tell like they would listen to the presentation but you tell that they were just like meh and then we were able to present in front of a big NICU corporation that does positioning devices dandelion um so I was able to speak with the owner Kathy and kind of go over stuff with her and they were very interested in this device. Um, so she had actually sent me some of their fabrics that they use for their positioning devices and said, you know, come up with, you know, use this fabric, you know, come up with a few different prototypes and, you know, let's test them out. So in my basement with her fabric, came up with it and, you know, you have to remember like they want it to be as cheap as possible. You know, the cuts and stuff have to be easy to make. And, you know, so just trying to remember that, like the stuff that she kind of told me when I was producing the stuff. So came up with a few different prototypes. You know, we would zoom and stuff back and forth. She, I sent her my final prototypes. And then based on those, um, they had kind of come up with like a final prototype. Um, and then they had sent it out to like 11 different people to try, not in a unit per se, but just get the idea of what, the product was about and stuff and I got good feedback however at that point in time dandelion the cost was more than what they felt like the product was worth at the time and stuff so it was a great process for me to go through and kind of get in with a good company that I knew was NICU you know developmental importance for them so and see that it got pushed and see all the feedback and stuff on that product um, it said it didn't come to fruition and stuff, but like I said, it was a neat process to go through. Yeah. And just how Beth said, you know, she had to have help with making her prototype, but you just did it in your basement with scraps of fabric. So, I mean, it's not like you have to have this, um, you know, fancy prototype, like you can just get by with what you can do in your basement. Um, so I like how that was created and then just, I think it was just right time. You had that rep. You spoke up. Well, actually, I do have this idea because how many nurses can you ask? Every one of us have an idea for something and something that we can make better. Bottom line, I, I think you have to be a risk taker, too, to be successful as a, a nurse innovator because you need to be able to take a risk in order to be successful. And and both of you have, you know, Beth reached out to somebody, other companies trying to get uh, help with a prototype. Kelly, you spoke up to the rep. Bottom line, you're saying don't be afraid to reach out um, to other companies um, for support and explain to you the importance of why your product would be helpful in uh, ultimately, right, improving outcomes for our babies. And some people might say, oh, well, was it a waste of time since, you know, no one picked up on it and all that kind of stuff. And I don't think it was a waste of time at all. Like, I still, you know, think it's a great product. I still am glad to be able to say, you know, I came up with this product. Like, yeah, it didn't go anywhere, but I still came up with this. It's a huge process. And I think you, you find that entrepreneurs tend to be serial entrepreneurs. So your first invention, um, isn't necessarily like the one, you know, that like is the one that you work with in your career. Um, but it's just that slight change in perspective of suddenly looking at like, I can change this and how many babies would this help? And um, how, you know, how many people would this help? Or, you know, if there's something that's just, you know, a fix that, you know, I think just having that change in thought process is huge and it makes a huge difference for you in the future. So, I mean, I don't think there's any failure in terms of like when it's, you know, when you're developing something. Um, I mean, I've been at this 10 years. And so like, I'm a little embarrassed when I tell people that, but like, it was an idea and I wasn't confident in the beginning that I was, you know, I bought something online retail, like, you know, bought this this like basically it was like a water filter, an osmotic water filter. And I started asking people, can we use this? Can I do this? Could we, 
you know, be concentrating milk at point of care so that people don't need to add cow milk fortifiers and a baby can get more of the benefits of mother's milk. And, you know, I was really excited when like neonatologists that I worked with who are researchers were willing to do tests, you know, and help me, like they wrote grant proposals with me. Um, but, you know, in the beginning, I really questioned it. I kept saying to myself, like, well, if it was, if it made sense, somebody else would have done it, you know, like, it's not going to be me that figures this out. And then after a while, I realized, actually, it just takes a long time to do some of these things. And so um, one of the things I think that was daunting midway through was when people were saying, like, what difference does it make anyway? Does anybody really care if a baby gets a little bit more of their mother's own milk? And, you know, God bless Trisha Johnson, <laughs> the human milk economist from Rush University, because she published papers on, you know, the real, the value, the actual monetary value and medical value of fresh mother's own milk. And so having a human milk economist work with us, um, we were able to, you know, we were, we were quoting her papers and then we you know, asked her if she would collaborate with us um, so that we could prove, you know, if, if we are using this um, in clinical studies that we have planned in the future, if we have funding, um, that, you know, that there's a benefit to both babies, families at hospitals um, to help babies get more of their mother's own milk. So, you know, there, there are times when you really, you can be challenged, um, but in a way, like we're working with a population that you need to challenge, you know, like you need to make sure that it's going to be safe and effective and beneficial. So I think, Having that pushback is really helpful, but it, it does, you know, it feels daunting at times if you are like doing this for the first time and you're like, <laughs> maybe you're right. Um, but it's also really exciting when you see that other people are doing things in this space too. So when I was presenting my product to um, companies initially, um, it was very hard because a lot of them were not NICU based companies. So they didn't understand developmentally appropriate for a premature baby. So trying to explain to them like, you know, we want midline, we want everything close to the body. And we are, at least at our NICU and a few of the NICUs I worked at, when we're securing umbilical lines and putting them in, we have our babies in four point restraints and we have them out like spread eagle tied to the night's nice lip bed. And that is not developmentally appropriate for any of these babies. So trying to explain to them, like, the importance, they're like, well, okay, you're, it takes, what, 30 minutes to an hour? They're in that position? Like, oh, like. So once I found a company that understood the importance, like Dandelion, understood the importance of positioning, developmentally appropriate positioning, then it was just like, I really didn't have to explain because they understood the importance of it. And so... It's important getting to those companies that, you know, understand the importance because, like I said, you know, a bunch of the companies I had presented to before, they just were like, well, why does it really matter? But they aren't NICU-based companies. They, you know, they were just line companies. It seems like to have somebody value your product and the impact that it will have is you really have to find the correct partnership. And at it seems like it takes a lot of grit and determination on the part of the nurse innovator to be able to, you know, uh, cultivate the right relationship or partnership um, with somebody, a uh, company that's willing to take this on. Um, and I and like I think that's very true, especially in the NICU. With we're very we have a very small uh, group of people in the NICU, and I, I think a lot of people don't understand. Um, what we do. We're not tiny. They're not tiny adults. Um, they have so many more needs. And I think that's really hard to translate to people that don't know anything about our little world. Right. And the guy that I had worked with, like he worked for a company that produced some NICU stuff, but mainly it was adult stuff. So that's why initially I was talking to a lot more adult companies and stuff like that. And I was trying to be like, okay, we need, like, they're not really getting it. And it's not, it took months. Like, I was doing maybe one, you know, presentation every other month, every two to three months, like when we could line stuff up, all of us together and stuff. So it was almost a year before I had even talked to Dandelion. Before oh my gosh. we had gotten, like, Dandelion on. So, you know, it's not, you know, I kept trying, you know, keep trying, keep trying, keep trying. And like I said, once I found that company that was like, yeah, if this works, this is going to be a fit, you know. And like I said, they understood the importance and stuff. So it took time to find that company that would understand it. But 
Beth, you mentioned that you had NIH funding for your medical product. Can you just tell us about how that process goes and how you were able to obtain that grant funding? When I first started out, I I just um, was in the very beginning process, and I, I thought I met with somebody, and she mentioned that I could qualify for NIH funding. Uh, this is a neonatologist, Cami Martin, um, at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center in Boston, and now she's in New York, but she's amazing. And uh, she recommended that I um, that I apply for SBIR funding, which is NIH funding um, that is for small business innovation. And so that would allow for proof of concept um, funding. And so it was like about a quarter of a million for uh, proof of concept funding. Then I also was able to apply in the state, I live in Colorado, um, for the Colorado um, Department of Economic Development and International Trade, and they gave us funding for, uh, for proof of concept. So we, we did a really small study and they were able to show that the milk was concentrated um, and that even the bioactives were concentrated in immunoglobulins. So we ended up going um, to uh, apply for NIH funding and then we got phase one and phase two. And phase two funding is really what we're using right now for research and development. And that can get followed on by phase 2B, uh, which allows for funding for clinical trials in hospitals. So um, so you're looking at like pretty amazing amounts of funding um, with those applications, like a quarter of a million, then you can get um, like almost 2 million and then 3 million. Um, and they even have commercial readiness pilot programs and they have um, like supporting entrepreneurs, um, like an office of supporting entrepreneurs uh, called SEED in the um, NIH. And so, I mean, there's a huge amount of resources out there that I had no idea because, you know, like you're working. <laughs> so, um, so the entrepreneur um, like courses and things that are out there are really exciting and fun to like check out. Um, and that can give you a lot of information, but we were able to do this with uh, most of what we've done with grant funding. So that means that, um, that we didn't have somebody invest in it that could then sort of take it away and like run away with it and do something nefarious. Like, um, you know, <laughs> I mean, there's a lot of diversion of milk, like, you know, people use it for other things than feeding babies. And so um, we really were dedicated to like, we want this device to help preemies and help save lives. So, um, so we are considered a for-profit. We've never sold anything yet, but we're, we're pre-market and we're in R&D and we've gotten all that funding from the NIH and the state grant from Colorado. And you were able to find out all this information with your connections with your neonatologist that you were working with to help guide you to know this. Because I don't think the average uh, bedside nurse uh, knows um, that path. So again, it's trying to find a good connection to help guide you. But researchers are always in your hospitals. And so like, whether it's like, you, you know, like I think for years I was literally scraping poop and like, you know, putting it in refrigerators for the researchers. And I was like, what, what research is happening here? Um, and so it's kind of exciting to realize that like a lot of times you are really busy and you don't know what they're doing, but a lot of the people you're working with have really cool projects going on and they know a lot about grant funding and they work with systems that do a lot of like uh, grant funding. The last uh, grant we applied for was four university hospital systems or four university systems, um, three NICUs. And it was incredible to see the coordination when their admin came in to help us um, submit that application. Like I was amazed, <laughs> like I was in awe um, because I don't have like resources like that. So the fact that these university systems could bring in everything and help us get an application in so that we could work together in the future was like amazing. And then you also, we talked uh, briefly a little bit earlier about um, hospital organizations that have their own uh, innovation centers or idea tanks. Um, and those, those organizations and those innovation centers can help also guide you. Yes, I think it's probably um, helpful to, if you are in a hospital system, I would say one of the best things you could probably do is bring in a few people from your, your NICU team uh, to make sure that you have, um, you know, like questions asked, challenges, like for anything, like, will this, you know, will this work? Is there a need? Is there like, just kind of like, kind of like um, pressure test it. And then once you have like a little team, then you go forward and you go to like one of those offices and say, this is what we'd like to do. Um, and, and if there is a, a patent involved, um, it's my understanding that you're probably not supposed to do anything public until you actually file that. So it would be something that would be kind of like, you know, um, 
that you meet with people, have a meeting with them and discuss it with them. Um, there's a lot of like things outside of hospital systems that, um, you know, like there's non-disclosures and things, but I think for within a hospital system, you're working together. So you kind of have that trust of all working together. And since you are employed by the hospital, um, there's, there's a good chance that the IP, the intellectual property will be owned um, or at least partially owned by the hospital system you work with. But that's also their incentive for helping you, you know, bring this to market and, and like help um, commercialize it if that's what you want. So I brought my prototype into the hospital to try. Um, I talked with my manager beforehand and was like, you know, I've come up with this idea. You know, I'm working with a company to see if it's something to move forward. Is it possible I can bring it into the unit and try it on our babies before I send it to them for sure and be like, yep, this is what I want to finalize the product to be like. And my hospital was very supportive of me. My manager was very supportive. She's like, absolutely bring it in. Like, if you want to keep it, you know, keep it you know, buy your stuff. So that way, if you do have to put in a line, it's right then and there. And we're not, you know, kind of looking for it and stuff like that. So I kept it in the unit. And then when I had the opportunity to put in a line, I brought it out and we put it on the baby. Um, Actually, the nurses all were like, this is fantastic. (laughs) Um, And like I said, my manager was very supportive of it. She was like, if you need to try it on some more babies, you know, feel free to bring in more, whatever you need, we're here to support you with this. So they were very supportive of me doing this. As nursing innovators and taking that path um, and trying to get your idea to come to life, we have to step out of our comfort zone as nurses from the bedside and go into more of an entrepreneurial role with business and engineers. Um, What kind of challenges did you face in that new world um, outside of the bedside? So I I was still working bedside um, with, I started working at a hospital after I filed a patent And then I was working bedside still, but I was working with like all these different uh, entrepreneurs, engineers, and met a lot of people in, uh, in like uh, innovation groups. And so one thing that I felt really fortunate about was that the NICU has a really positive welcoming uh, environment where people are really supportive of each other and they want to see something that benefits babies and families Um, come to market and they aren't, they're focused on, you know, like if it is something that would actually be commercialized, but they're also looking at it, you know, from all different perspectives. And so it's not the only thing. And I think that that's something that's huge. And it's also interesting that like in the NICU, people are so supportive of other people working in that space. Uh, Whereas like, um, I think in different areas of innovation, there's a little bit more like competition and you see a little bit more cutthroat sort of <laughs> interactions. And that's not been my experience at all with, with NICU. I feel like we've been really fortunate that everyone is focused on, on what's best for babies and families and wants, you know, to have things, you know, if, if we can improve something for babies and families, we want to do that. And I think that that is unique and very wonderful about uh, innovation in NICU. When you innovate in a NICU, it's really important to remember like what your goal, your end goal is. If you want to help babies, you can, you can get something, um, you know, through a system and look at, you know, how it might help babies. And that can be a huge motivator. Even if like when you start working for a hospital system, you may have signed something that said that, you know, like the, the hospital might own intellectual property developed. And so that might not be entirely yours if you developed it at work. Um, but if you're helping babies and you really want to do this, I wouldn't let it stop you. I would say that, you know, use all the resources you can in that system because they're there to help you. And that could be something that really expedites things. Um, I've sort of done this, you know, more independently with, um, with, I say independently, I just mean not working with a hospital system um, as an employer. Uh, I've done it with a lot of, you know, federal grant support and state grant support and a lot of colleagues um, in the past and um, ones I've worked with who've been wonderful. So um, I think it's a great way to go. If you want to innovate something, I wouldn't let it stop you. You know, the idea of like the, you know, something being partly owned by a hospital system, if it's going to help babies, you're probably like, you want it there anyway. (laughs) So it might as well be you that's coming out with a plan because if somebody else comes out with it, you're going to be like, why did they do this? (laughs) (laughs) The nurse should have been in the room. (laughs) Even if you have an idea, write it down. Like, if you don't have the time to 
go forward with it at this point in your life and stuff, write down your idea. Come back to it in a few months, maybe even a year or so. Like, I had thought of this idea way before I had even met, you know, this rep. So it's just like, I had this idea. I didn't know where to go with it. I always had it kind of in the back of my mind and stuff like that. But I had had it in my mind for years before I went somewhere with it. So, like I said, even if it's not the right time, like, write your ideas down. You never know when that right time is going to come across or someone comes, you know, to you and it's just that time works for you guys. You know, have that idea. Always have it written down. Have it somewhere written down for you to come back to. Thank you for sharing all of your journeys and how you were able to translate these amazing ideas to new devices and to bring them to life to ultimately help the outcomes of our babies. And I'm sure everybody is feeling very empowered and inspired by you. Everybody should have their notes app open at work to take notes of all of their great ideas um, because all it takes is a small idea to make such a huge impact on the babies that we care for every day. So thank you for sharing your stories. Make sure you never miss an episode of NANCAST by subscribing now. This episode is made possible by listeners like you. Thanks for your support and letting us into your ears. Have a great day.